Hi, everybody. So hi, thank you. Hi, my name is John Solipodi. I'd like to thank the Democracy Group and Brandon Stover for inviting us to host this conversation on deepening connection at the Thanksgiving table. And I'd like to welcome my partner, Martha Williams. Hi, everybody. Thanks for having us, uh, Brandon and the Democracy Group. We're excited to be here today. Um, just a little background on us. Uh, John and I are the co-founders of Culture Shift Agency. We're dedicated to shifting culture by shifting the conversation because conversation is the fabric that holds us together. And we're making this shift happen through two projects, Break Bread World and Mindful Conversation. Break Bread World is a project that grew out of the pandemic to keep ourselves connected to community, but quickly grew into something much larger. Break Bread brings folks together over the dinner table, virtually or in person, for food and conversation, for the purpose of celebrating and restoring our common humanity. And mindful conversation is a practice we teach to help people have more agency in conversation. Um, we do break bread in our own community, but are also bringing um, break bread to organizations and businesses uh, to help them grow, invigorate, and restore their own communities. And it's these two projects that are why the Democracy Group reached out to collaborate with us. And needless to say, we're excited to have this conversation about Thanksgiving, um, the national family meal, um, as meals can be at the heart of nourishment. And before we get in started in intros um, and uh, to the meat of our time together, we just wanna do a brief check-in with everyone. We'd like to hear from everyone in the chat. So not just me and John and, and the panelists, but the audience as well. So um, we're just gonna check in. We'll just gonna, we're gonna type in the chat how we're showing up. Okay, so before we do that, we just wanna, take our eyes down um, and just be here in this moment to just check in and how we're showing up. And we wanna hear from everybody here. So how we're showing up, showing up in our mind and our bodies and our hearts. And then you can open your eyes and just chat, put it in the chat. So. And for this, it's the Q and A. Yes. Oh, so, okay. So is everyone doing this? Yes. No one's doing this. Might not be open. There we go. Is that it? Okay. Curious and optimistic. Okay, type an answer, there we are. Um, excited. All right, answer. We've got a couple answers here. I feel you. Yeah, typing the answer. I know the multitask, good one. So, Great, we just like to do that because we so often don't, I can't see what people are typing. So I'm not, I don't know why I'm just, I'm somehow missing that part of things. So um, can anybody see what people are, ch are chatting? Yes, if you go to open in the queue. Okay, open, there it is. Okay. So um, we just do this because um, showing up is something we teach in our introduction to mindful conversation course. And we ask that question because we, we often don't really think about how, how we're showing up. And just by checking in, we're one step closer to being present. Um, and that's a really useful tool when we're gathering in conversation. So um, we are happy to introduce our four incredible colleagues to talk with us today. We have Mila Atmos. Mila is a global citizen based in New York City. Thank you, Mila, for being here. And is a producer and series of, uh, and series host of Future Hindsight, a weekly podcast that aims to spark civic engagement through in-depth conversations with citizens change makers. 
we have um, Kara, Kara Ong Whaley. Um, she is the host of Democracy Matters, a podcast to educate and inspire people to address public issues and cultivate a just and inclusive democracy. She's also Associate Director of James Madison Center for Civic Engagement at James Madison University. We also have Turi Munta. Turi is the founder of Parlia, the Encyclopedia of Argument, and the host of On Opinion, which looks to understand where our opinions come from. Then we have Steve House, Senior Director of Strategic Initiatives at Braver Angels, a national organization whose mission it is, is to bring Americans together to bridge the partisan divide and strengthen our democratic republic. So thank you all for being here. And I'll uh, hand it over to, to John to kick us off with the first question. Thank you. So for today, our topic is deepening connection at the Thanksgiving table. And Thanksgiving is, a, is an American family holiday tradition where we're supposed to come together to celebrate our bounty and good fortune and to give thanks. However, for some, uh, the Thanksgiving table can feel like a microcosm of an America that many see as divided and torn. And we're asking if we can't come together in our own families at our own holiday tables, will we ever be able to come together as a country? So we thought we'd start today by just talking about tradition, a word that's often seated at the very nexus of polarization between those who seek to preserve what they see as tradition and sometimes those who lean towards change and question tradition. And ironically, if you look back on US history, uh, challenging tradition seems to be an American tradition. So we thought by starting, we would start out by asking this first question, are the bonds of tradition being tested or even broken at your holiday tables? And do you see parallels in our greater society? So we thought we'd open up with, I'm gonna to go to Turi because he's laughing. And I might add that, that Turi is from England. So it's a, it's a different perspective, uh, not being from the States. And I thought it was an opportunity to perhaps get a different viewpoint. John, that's very naughty of you. Um, <laughs> and thank you very much um, for inviting me. Martha, John, it's a real pleasure to be with you uh, and to be with you, Kara, Stephen, and Mila. Um, and I'm looking forward to this conversation. So yes, I'm a complete fraud. I should absolutely not be here. I'm a, I'm a Brit, the people that you guys escaped from and, and are giving thanks to, not, to no longer be part of. So, um, I mean, it's almost heretical that I should be here, um, which makes it all the more honoring to have been invited. Um, John, the thing which strikes me so much about tradition is that itself, as you've just framed, it's um, on some level polarizing. Um, we have natural tendencies towards and against tradition almost baked into our genes um, uh, from a left, right, progressive, conservative perspective. So it's as if, the, it's as if this, um, this event itself um, is designed to trigger um, those quite deep-seated instincts of conservatorship on the one hand and progressive on the other. It's a, it's a triggering event full stop. It's not a neutral thing as you frame. Um, left and right respond very differently to rules. Um, but one of the things which is so interesting about it is that while it may, um, it, 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 at, at first it feels like it's, exclude, it's exclusionary of um, change of opportunity. One of the great benefits of tradition is that it brings two of probably the most important uh, elements that we see for positive conversation. And one of those is um, a sense of facing together in the same direction, a common goal. And tradition articulates in itself a kind of a common goal because it's a shared ritual. Um, and also inside tradition come these uh, sometimes constraining, chafing rules, but rules themselves are also fundamentally useful for um, 
even if they're very light touch for great conversation. So it feels as if um, tradition itself contains both all the um, the seeds of discontent and some of its um, and some of its solutions all in one. Mm, thank you, Mila. How's Thanksgiving at your table doing? Uh, well, <laughs> well, it's uh, a little bit like Tori explained uh, just now. I think it's very well put that the, the seeds of discontent are baked into tradition, into tradition of showing up at the Thanksgiving table, but also at the same time, uh, this is where you can solve this problem. I think one of the opportunities with this tradition of coming together and breaking bread, right, is that um, to me, it's, uh, really an act of coming together with love and gratitude with your family. And even though you may not always appreciate them, here you are, you, despite perhaps whatever differences you might have and family is complicated, right? So it doesn't have to be necessarily just your political views that get in the way of maybe having uh, a more carefree time, but it's an opportunity to, uh, you know, to have, an open discussion because I think at the end of the day, when you walk away, these people will still love you. You know, this is not some stranger you're encountering. And so I think it's really uh, fertile to have conversations that you might not take on in other places. And perhaps that's why you're doing them because you feel like, yeah, you might get into an argument, uh, but when it's all done, you know, tomorrow you're going to call and everything's okay. Or next year you're going to come back together and have a similar type of conversation or maybe something different, but you are confident that those bonds will last. And I think in that sense, this tradition of coming together over Thanksgiving is very valuable or any, any holiday meal. For the sake of the unbreakable bonds of family. Kara, at your, at your table is, is the polarization reflected that you're seeing in the, um, do you see parallels in the greater society? Are they showing up at your table or how are, how are you moving into this holiday? So thank you so much for the opportunity to join this discussion with you all mm -hmm. um, and, and, and really to be thinking about the role of tradition um, and how it might be manifesting in our in our families, before I answer how it's appearing in my own personal life, which I promise I will share. <laughs> um, I want us to also think about the role of tradition to begin with and what those traditions are based off of. I cannot not come to this conversation without the lens of being a political scientist and analyzing uh, power structures. <laughs> Um, and therefore want us to think about what sorts of traditions we have and also the myths about those traditions that we might carry and then the narratives about those traditions. So when we're talking about Thanksgiving um, in particular, um, you know, we are sort of celebrating one particular view even in this conversation um, about what it is and should be. And that view is driven by people in power and those who are wanting to propagate a particular story um, or, or view. Um, and that can render other members within our society invisible um, and, and also continue to propagate disinformation um, about what America is. And so that's how I'm coming to our table um, and trying to think about whose voices have traditionally been marginalized or minoritized um, in quote unquote tradition. Um, and really think about what questions I can ask to try to move conversations forward, even though we are deeply polarized around issues of inequality and race and class in this country. So in my family, I'm a first generation college student. I have five younger brothers uh, and sisters. Only half of us went to college. Um, and you can see the polarization along those educational lines manifesting around the issues um, that we see in America today. And it's not surprising. Um, and so as somebody who tries to 
study and look at structures and systems, politics and power. Um, oftentimes I find myself approaching these conversations with curiosity and questions um, rather than kind of trying to come in and proselytize. Um, although at times I don't always, cannot always be restrained. <laughs> um, and it's increasingly hard for me to do so as we see uh, the perpetuation and instantiation of inequities. Um, in this country. Mm, thank you. I'd like to get back to you on some of those points, but first I want to bring Steve's voice to our gathering and invite Steve to share his take on that first question. So um, first of all, John, one of the premises you brought up was that if we don't get it right at the family table, we may not get it right for the country. Uh, it may actually be the opposite because I think sometimes in the family settings, people just bottle up the stress. They contain their stress over their differences with other family members. They never talk about it. You know, they're not starting a war on your front porch. They're not doing anything like that. They're just bottling it up and walking away with it. So I'm not sure. It may be that we need to get politics right to actually improve the American family. We'll have to see how that plays out. Mm -hmm. um, for Turi, I'm 51% British. So, you know, you're not alone. Um, that's according to 23andMe anyway. Um, the tradition thing in, in my family is interesting because as generations have moved forward, when I was a kid under the age of 15, Thanksgiving was a religious holiday in our house because my family was deeply spiritual, very faith-based. Thanksgiving was about thanking God, thanking each other. There was a lot of religious traditions in it. And then we go forward another generation where my parents weren't as spiritual as their parents. And it was less so that it became about, you know, be thankful to which person, you know, in your life, what was the best moment of your year and things like that. And then later in my generation, we became more faith based and went back the other direction. Now my millennial children are going back the other way. So sometimes it's hard to go through that change in tradition. The one tradition that we've implemented as of last year, and we're carrying it through this year, is something I shared with you and Martha before. Um, on, in my daily life, I turn my cell phone off at 6 p.m. and I do not reach for it again until the following morning. And one of the traditions for our Thanksgiving dinner this year is you cannot attend the dinner unless you're willing to put your cell phone in a box when you walk in the door and not touch it again until the dinner is over because we want you to be fully present. I think that actually is going to help the conversation and that's why I'm excited about that possibility. Mm. Well, I love that. Yeah, brilliant. That's great. You actually have to talk to each other face to face. Yeah. John, did you have a question or because there's so much to, to chew on here? There really is. Um, I thought your comment about flipping that equation was very interesting, Steve, about perhaps if we can't get the politics right, we can't get the, the family right. And, and that could be true. Mm -hmm. um, but it also made me think that what we what we might be what might be happening in politics is we're hearing the loudest extremist voices and there's a whole middle that's relatively silent and and this silent group is also a way we deal with family at least at my house sometimes is there's a lot of silence and a lot of avoidance around but the um let's say, just say the tender touch points might be, and so nobody speaks up. And I think that might also be playing into this, um, th this tension at the table. Yeah, I certainly think that's true. I mean, you know my political background, I was deeply involved um, as a state chairman for the Republican Party in Colorado. And I can tell you that people were more than willing on social media or face-to-face -to, -face to be openly critical of decisions I made or what I was doing but speak to their own wife or child about something that they were concerned about, they just wouldn't do it. They would leave that alone. So the communication via social media and otherwise was very direct, probably healthy, um, but it wasn't healthy in their own families. They just weren't willing to take on the big issues that way. And I think we have to get that resolved. Yeah. Can I jump in here? Cause I, I also like Steve's, Steve's comment about this, flipping the politics and the personal. Um, and, this perhaps sounds contrarian given quite how 
messy, both the US and I have to say, unfortunately, the UK is at a political level polarized by Brexit, polarized by a response to the coronavirus um, and many things besides. But um, there's a political philosopher that, Kara, I know you know, called Bob Talese, who's at Vanderbilt University. And one of his great, I think, additions to this question of discourse is to say, um, enough of taking it so seriously. If we can somehow dial down our sense of the importance of the conversations that we're having at a political level, we can be a little bit freer, both with our opinions and the opinions of others. To Steve's point, because there's um, perhaps less personal stuff at stake, the conversation flows more freely. Um, it talks frankly to the fact that one of the reasons that Thanksgiving table is so terribly fraught is because it matters at a profound existential level. And what Bob's line would be is that when we bring that sense of existential threat or existential identitarian um, trauma maybe or importance to political discussions, we infuse them with the same, um, the same frenzy as, um, as the most emotional conversations that we have over a dinner table with our families. And perhaps that's exactly what we shouldn't be doing. So um, yeah, I'm going back to Steve's point here that actually it may be that politics is easier to fix um, <laughs> than Thanksgiving dinner. Kara's completely not agreeing, but disagrees, go for it. <laughs> yeah, Kara, let's, let's hear from you. Well, I just, <laughs> I, I was just laughing because I'm thinking about how difficult it will be to fix our politics in this moment. And, you know, at, at what level do we even begin to start? And I think for me, one of the things I think about a lot is just the fact that we can't even get on the same page with information that we have. So even when we're presented the same information, whether it's politicians or family members, we can't even agree on that information and what it means. And so, you know, I wonder if there's something even deeper about, you know, being able to, uh, you know, being able to look at information, how we process information, right? And then how we embrace um, our reactions, um, you know, to that information. Um, to move forward, um, and, you know, and I think, well, I'll stop there. <laughs> yeah, Steve. Yeah, my my, uh, my question. I thought that was a great point you just made. Was is if you think about the average American family, while many people care about their family members, there seems to be an an inordinary, maybe an extraordinary emphasis on political issues that you wouldn't think would have such a big impact on any individual, right? So we seem to get way more upset about certain issues in the political spectrum, whether they affect us at all or not. I mean, maybe you don't drive and you're really worried about the price of gas for some reason. And, you know, you're all mad about the price of gas, but within the family, you know, my brother, you know, got a DUI and, you know, I found out he got a DUI and he paid his, paid his bail and he did everything. And I, I don't even talk to him about it. You know, that should concern me more because it's personal. It's within my family and he got a DUI and he's probably put himself at risk. I don't understand. And maybe Kara, you do with what you do, why so many people place so much emphasis on issues that make them angry or otherwise emotional that don't seem to have an impact on their life. And yet we don't do it at the Thanksgiving table with personal issues involving our family members. I think that's very true. This, this juxtaposition between local and global. Yep. I'd like to invite Maya, Mila, um, this local global discussion is, is often, I think like Steve said, glossed over or missed. Um, we don't talk about what's happening locally and we go to global. Well, I think it's easier to talk about global issues because it's uh, at a remove, right? Or like whatever is perhaps pertinent to your own family is really, it's it's too close, right? You you don't want to get into a fight with your brother about the DUI, but you're happy to talk about something that happens in the news about somebody that you don't know, which is precisely to your point, Steve, with the people who are happy to criticize you on social media because they don't actually personally know you and they're pers they're perfectly happy to attack you <laughs> in that forum. Um, but I think one of the things that Turi said here was really interesting is that we don't have to take ourselves so seriously. I think one of the things that makes 
these conversations so combative is that we have this uh, urgency nowadays to win an argument. But I think we don't have to, we can just hear the other person out and understand them better. And maybe that can get, get us moving towards this common goal that we share as, as humans. You know, we, uh, if we don't understand the other person's point of view, um, however misguided we may believe them to be, uh, you know, you can't actually start to find solutions. I think we, many of us would agree that we would approach problem solving completely differently. You know, I problem solve differently than my husband or my children. <laughs> I mean, you know, so we can't expect other people to do the same thing. But if we can just be open-minded and have a sense of humor and engage in the listening and uh, be open to another person's perspective, I think um, that's, that's really a, an important starting point and not try to get in there and win, win the battle, so to speak, you know? I think, I think that leads to nowhere and then the conversation stops. I just wanted to briefly weigh in on this. Um, you know, I think there's something, you know, it, it, a distinction to make between you know, we, we said something about we, we don't get upset when, you know, a member of our family might get a DUI, right? Um, you know, we can love, we, we still love and accept them, right? That was a behavior that happened, right? They're still fundamentally the same person. But then yet, when they might challenge our beliefs, there's a different reaction, right? And so there's a, I want to make that distinction between, you know, we might be having different reactions because there's behavioral and then there's challenging of belief systems. And we do know from political psychology research that that is very trigger, triggering and that people do have much greater, you know, it's the way our brains are functioned, right? This is a defensive mechanism that is actually built into us um, for us to emotionally respond um, you know, when we think our beliefs um, are challenged. And, and so that's a little bit harder to, you know, to work through, especially in a moment, right, um, that, that where, where it might be tense. Um, and when our um, fight or flight mechanisms have, have kicked in, and not all of us have necessarily been to therapy to think through how we actually might work through those situations. Yeah, I was going to ask, um, what is the urgency? And it seems like you just answered that, that beliefs are being tested and pushed and questioned. And you also mentioned, Kara, um, that tradition is about power dynamics. And I just wonder um, if anybody wants to speak to that, because I know for me and my family, what's so tense is that we're upholding this really old family power dynamic where my father's at the head of the table. He doesn't accept us into equanimity. And so it's never really that fun because he's living in this other paradigm. And so in my love of him, I often am just silent and we just let him be. So is that the right, is that the right way to handle that power, power dynamic? Um, so just want to, does anybody have anything to say about the role of, of the power dynamic in this, uh, in the Thanksgiving table and as it relates to democracy? I think it, um, so first of all, Martha, as the person who's now risen to the head of the table, I don't want anybody to change my power dynamic because I'm at the head of the table and I get to eat first, but, um, <laughs> setting that aside, there is a power dynamic and how the dinner you know, proceeds and there's a fear, you know, people are afraid to speak up on certain things. I mean, I clearly in my family, there's a couple of people who would say, why are we eating at all? I mean, this is a holiday celebrating taking land and life away from Native Americans. Why are we eating at all? I mean, we shouldn't even be having this celebration. We should be fasting, you know, instead. But, you know, those are, you know, the 25 year old children of my generation who um, have a different awareness of it than we do. And so, by the virtue of the fact that they're not sitting at the head of the table, they're not bringing that up. And quite frankly, we probably should talk about it. I really think we should. And I think that if we could find a way to open it up so that they didn't have fear in bringing those issues up, 
it's kind of like you're going back to the the defund the police thing right if you if you live in a major city like denver colorado and defund the police is an issue you might have a serious opinion on it but if you live in uray colorado defund the police means absolutely nothing so you can't have a discussion between two people on the subject that live one in uray and one in denver they, they just don't matter however if you want to talk about the meaning of thanksgiving and you're willing to open up to the discussion to that i think the people at the head of the table have to lead and make that happen. And I don't know that that's happening as well today with those of us sitting at the head. Mm. There's a, one of the things which I'm, I'm most touched by of my faith, which is Judaism, is that there is a long tradition after the destruction of the second temple of rabbinic exegesis. And essentially what happens with the very, very short background history, but um, with the destruction of the second temple, um, but under the Romans, all the sites of ritual for Judaism disappeared. The place that one sacrificed, the place that one um, burnt offerings, etc., all went. And so what happened is that the, all these traditions, all these rituals, in a sense, had to move, not unlike us today, into the realm of the virtual. They, they were essentially, we moved on to Zoom in around uh, at, at the turn of the of two millennials ago. What that means is that the process of tradition what tr what tradition is is a particular form of argumentation it's a particular form of conversation where the texts which are being used are constantly the same ones but the work is done anew every time so one of the things which is so beautiful about reading the rabbinic exegesis on the bible is that you are reading the commentary of other people who like you have tried to find a relevant truth about the same piece of text a hundred years ago, 500 years ago, a thousand years ago. And in a sense, the tradition is in that. The tradition is in going back and questioning this foundational text of the Bible and coming up with new iterations, coming up with new interpretations for a very contemporary um, context every time. And what that does is it builds this beautiful line of transmission of thoughts between humans going back thousands of years now, 2000 years, trying to do the same thing, trying to establish what counts as some form of virtue. Um, and that is very beautiful. And I feel, Steve, you've just described something very similar, which is that if the Thanksgiving table is a place to give thanks, that question of thanks needs to be opened up every time. And that makes great conversation. I feel that's, Kara, a little bit what you're talking about too. Um, it's bringing it all open to the table, but with this tradition of doing it, it's the reason that we have the anniversaries, it's the reason that we have a kind of a yearly cycle of things. It reminds us to do things over an extended period of time because that repetition in itself does funky things to the way that we think and the way that we feel. Mm -hmm. I love what you just said, Tori, and, and Steve. And it, it also prompted me to think about the way in which tradition um, uh, and even if we want to think about Thanksgiving in this context, has really become a, an institution and how we institutionalize those norms and practices. But then what happens, you know, similarly, like with our political institutions, what happens when those institutions are no longer responsive, right? And we, we had someone who is participating, talking about uh, suggesting, what if we created a new tradition? And I think that's something, you know, if, we're, if we think about, you know, trying to reimagine what the tradition looks like. Um, if we can come together and think about, um, you know, what kinds of conversations should we be reimagining or envisioning at the table each year? Um, you know, and, and that, and who gets, and this is why it's a power dynamic, who gets to decide, right, what that tradition is, but how can we reimagine it collectively together? Um, I think that's what our politics needs, <laughs> and it is what our, our families need in this moment, too, is how do we come together in a collective project where we reimagine what these traditions, what these political institutions look like, what our families look like, and how we can engage together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Steve. Thank you, Kara. So I, I think that's a great comment. One of the things that always comes up for me as a question is traditions generally are based on a set of truths, things that you all know as a family, right? It's Thanksgiving, right? Um, the pilgrims were good people. The Indians and pilgrims ate together. It was a positive experience. Columbus was a good person. When those truths start to get questioned, 
then traditions fall apart, right? Because you could be sitting at a table with half the people believing that Thanksgiving is a good thing and the other half not believing it's a good thing. During my period of growing up, primarily in the 70s, um, it was never a question. You never had that. And I think we've got a unique challenge right now because what the truth is, both morally and absolutely the truth in a lot of situations has either changed or it's in flux. So how do you have a tradition if you don't know what the truth is or you don't all agree on what it is? I think it's interesting what Turi mentioned about Judaism. I grew up Catholic. Me too. My Catholicism was grounded in not questioning. It was really, this is the way it is. And to question was um, troubling. It was put down. It was to ask too many questions uh, was troublesome. And later in my 20s, I studied Judaism for a short while, and I was just floored by this tradition that Turi mentioned of, of questioning. And it was interesting how that tradition, um, questioning tradition doesn't mean throwing it out. And there's this renewal, this opportunity for renewal. And I don't know that that's in our culture and our tradition in the United States, where questioning is actually a threat. And I wonder if this is a um, side effect of Christianity. It could be. It could be a side effect of the political environment and Christianity combined. But what you're really talking about, John and Turi, you should weigh in on this. I think that by asking questions about Judaism, and I studied theology as a minor in college myself, by asking questions, when you get the answers, it solidifies the truth for you because you're not relying on someone else's opinion of the truth, you go find it on your own. And oftentimes, if it is the same truth, then you end up in a great place to have traditions and have a solid foundation. Yeah. And I wanna bring Mila in, because a lot of your podcasts do this exact thing, I think, the ones that I've heard, is really oh. questioning status quo and putting a different bent on it. And I thought that was interesting. And I think there's an interesting point to be made here. Well, um, on the subject of truth, I think there are some uh, objective realities, you know, like the sky is blue or it's not blue. Uh, and I think when people talk about truth now uh, and they say the truth is shifting, I would disagree with that um, description. I would say that we didn't know the fuller picture. And so the truth looks different today than it used to but it isn't that it has, you know, that one thing is true and another thing is not. You know, were the pilgrims good people? I'm sure some of them are, uh, just like some of us are right now. And some of us, some of the pilgrims were bad people. Uh, you know, like this is to say the it just it's like the simplification to say the pilgrims are good and we broke bread together with the Native Americans at that time and it was all good. Clearly, that wasn't true. You know, as we know now, the evidence has shown us uh, it's not fully accurate. And so, and that a lot of the Native Americans at that time were starving. And so uh, I think we need to be very careful when we talk about what's true and what's not, unless we actually really know the truth. And sometimes we don't know it, <laughs> you know, that's the other part. Truth is sometimes not um, evident. Uh, that's a good point. Mm -hmm. and, and, and the picture becomes fuller and we, we get to know more and more over time. Mm -hmm. Right. What, uh, Mila, I love where you come at this. Um, the truth as, um, as something which is uh, arrived at or gestured to, the importance of not taking ourselves too seriously. Um, this business of reminding ourselves not to try to win the argument. All of these things resonate very, very strongly with me. Um, one of the things which has been fascinating building my um, slightly delusional encyclopedia of argument has been um, it emerged from a from a from a sort of realization that when you're really faced with somebody on the other side of a fence which you care about it's not that you don't think it's not that you think that they're wrong is that they feel morally um, corrupt in some way. And they also, and this is the thing which has always struck me, they feel insincere. I can never, I, you know, people who I really disagree with, I can't really believe that they think what they think. 
Um, uh, um, I think here is one of the one of the nightmares is that one that's the first step towards dehumanizing the other. Right, um, but but two um, also points to is if you flip it, I'm using the Steve, the famous Steve House flip, um, and you think of this in slightly <laughs> different terms, what it does is it reminds you that um, if, if, um, if you see the other side as irrational and, uh, and untethered in reality, um, they see the same thing around you, and they may be right. And in fact, maybe both sides are right. Um, most of our cognition is done for social purposes, not um, to get to the truth. We don't really care that much about the objective truth in most of our interactions. We're mostly performing a series of um, sort of epistemological gestures for protection, to build tribe, to make sure we're safe, to ensure that we're inside a community. Um, and, um, and an extension of that is therefore you know, an enormous number of the opinions that we think are ours, our ideas which we cherish, that we think we've achieved we've earned through rational sweat and toil. They come from our stomachs, they don't come from our heads. Um, and this realization, I suppose, Mila, to your point, that, that our ideas, we should just take them a little less seriously, we should take our own rationalism a little bit less seriously, um, I think it's a very nice step. It's a useful thing for me anyway, in my engagement with the other side, um, because I, you sort of put yourself in the head of the other person looking back at you and, agree with them that you, you probably don't know what you're talking about. Well, I would add here is that when you take yourself slightly less seriously, I think it helps you to stay humble. You know, if you come to a conversation with humility and you show that you're open-minded, then you may be persuaded by the other person's argument, which is not to say that you will be. I think they're maybe also more open to hear you out, you know, um, which again, uh, I think if we think we're going to change somebody else's mind, um, it's very difficult. I, I don't think you should go into the conversation with this assumption. That's very, very tricky. Uh, and then you will most definitely get into a fight. And so uh, I think the purpose is to share ideas and perspectives. And uh, and little by little, I hope that we, we can arrive sort of at the same goal, you know, a more human place to live on this planet. One of, the, one of the best experiences I've had thus far with Braver Angels has been one-on-one -on -one conversations with people who would be completely the opposite of me in a political ideological sense. And the key to those conversations being successful and relationships being built is simply saying, why do you believe what you believe? If I understand why you believe what you believe, then it helps me humanize you and have a conversation. If you don't, If I don't know why you believe something that I am opposed to, then I don't have any basis of having a real conversation. So understanding why people believe what they believe at the family level, at the community level, at the political level, I think is really important. Yeah, and I think that that speaks to some strategies for choices that we can make. Uh, you know, how do we like how do we short circuit the performative, as, as Terry Munch mentioned, or um, people feeling their identi identities being threatened? or this urgency to win, how do, we, how do we short circuit that or leap ahead? And I think Steve uh, asking that question is, is one way to do it. Um, are there other thoughts or examples, things that, have, things that you've tried or can suggest? I think one other question that um, after Steve's question, why do you believe that? Uh, that I found useful, uh, not always successful, sometimes they puts people kind of back in their heels is to ask, what would change your mind? You know, what would it take for you to change your mind? Like what would be the evidence that you need? Uh, and evidence is maybe not the right thing, but sort of, you know, like Tori said, this is all about what you believe in your gut. And so <laughs> evidence may, is not going to be the thing that's going to change your mind, but there's something, you know, there's something that you might discover that might lead you to another thought that you didn't have before. It's great. Yeah, I think going off of what you both have said, I, I also approach it from a from an inquisitive or curious point of view. Um, I, I try to understand um, 
I, I think this is partially, you know, behind Steve's question, but where, where do you come from? What's your life story? Um, and I don't usually ask it that way, <laughs> but just trying to ask someone about their experiences um, and, you know, who they are as a person, um, you know, kind of reinstills that humanity because I think, you know, our, we are, we are a product of our experiences and we all, you know, we, we have different worldviews because we have different experiences in this world. Um, and, and so learning more about the, the past of an individual, um, I think is, is really important um, in getting at that, why they believe what they might believe. Um, and, and then also another question that I'll, I'll try to hone in on is, you know, well, what does that mean to you? Um, you know, for example, when we've had this question of, or this tagline, which I think is a terrible tagline, the hashtag defund the police, um, you know, what does that mean to you? Because that, that is something that has been extremely polarizing. Um, and, you know, I just hosted um, a Capitol Police officer on campus the other day. And, you know, he, uh, we, you know, we were talking about this and he was talking about this with, with students, you know, for him, you know, as a Capitol Police officer, you know, he, the notion of defund the police is really not just you, you reduce the number of police officers, is, it's that you fund additional social workers because police can't respond to every situation. And so I think getting at this, you know, this question of, you know, what, what does, you know, whatever tagline or talking point we might hear um, in, in the dominant narratives, you know, tr trying to get at why people, how people understand what that means or, or why, or, or what that meaning has. Um, I think there's, there's a way to find some commonalities um, and common ground and really think about, okay, well, we, we might agree that there is this problem, but then again, how can, how can we address it collectively? And I think getting at, at that meaning making question is really important as well. There's a, there's a last element to this, which may be almost the framer of it, which is you know, everything that the three of you said, I think makes deep sense to me, but there's also this key piece, perhaps also at a table, which is, you know, what, why are you doing what you're doing now? Why are you arguing in this way now? What's happening now? What's, it, what's the function of the thing that's happening? And there are certain conversations, for, for all good conversations to happen, they, everybody needs to be doing the same thing. And that's either trying to hear the other side or trying to hash out some kind of workable consensus. Um, but when, um, when people are doing different things, ostensibly via the same medium, it, 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 you, you end up you end up sort of by definition nowhere if somebody's trying to listen and somebody's trying to assert themselves or if somebody's trying to be heard and someone else uh, is trying to um, to stabilize um, you end up at cross purposes because of course again we, we think for a function we don't just think in a void we talk in a function not just in a void so I'm hearing from both of you, there's this idea of getting kind of getting behind things and trying to understand, getting going a little bit deeper, not taking things at face value. Yeah. Yes, finding, finding ways to move into understanding. I think Steve, we're- Do you wanna add anything? Sorry, John. Well, I think we're, we're on the verge of needing to wrap up and recap. So I just wanted to, um, invite each person to, to perhaps share a takeaway uh, for you know, what holds the promise of help or hope, uh, perhaps something that our audience members can bring to their holiday gatherings. And I think we've mentioned some, but are there others? And um, I thought I'd start with, with Martha before I put anybody else on the spot. Oh, okay. So, so yeah, we, um, I have a takeaway that um, we can offer to our audience. Um, the Break Bread World, at the center of every Break Bread World uh, experience, which is a dinner, we have a prompt and it's, a, it's, a, it's one question and it's designed to really bring, bring people together. 
um, let me see if I can find this prompt, here it is. And so we offer this prompt as um, a way to get below the events of the world and to get below gossip. Um, and so we just offer this to you. And it is, we say grace at the beginning of every meal as a way of giving thanks, but grace can also refer to receiving a divine or profound gift. How or where has grace revealed itself in your life? So we bring these questions to the, to the center of our dinners um, as a way to, uh, to instigate storytelling, to bring people into their feeling states, and also to bring people into something that, that is uh, something we all share. So we, we work in, the, in the, the level of common humanity. So that's our offering. Anyone else? Or and I think it also speaks to lightening the mood, and perhaps not taking yourself seriously, as was said earlier. I certainly love Steve's box, putting cell phones away in the box. You know where that comes from, John? And maybe this is the moment of grace for me. Um, the last couple of years, every year in January, I go to Kenya and I go to the poorest areas of Kenya with a humanitarian group, doctors mostly, um, and we do healthcare work. And um, last year, a woman approached me who had to be no more than about four feet tall. She had no hair, no teeth. She had a folder in her hand and she handed it to me. And, and I said, is this your medical records? And nobody has medical records. And she said, yes. And I opened it up and there was a birth certificate in there. And her birthday was July 10th of 1900. And I said, are you really 120 years old? And this was January. And she said, no, I'm only 119. And I said, why are you here? And people confirmed her age. And she said, my youngest child died at 92 last year and I can't read the Bible anymore. And she said, peace and grace for me starts with reading good words and reflecting on those good words before I interact with any other person that day and every day. And I have adopted that. And it's been an incredible experience doing that as well as getting rid of the cell phone after five o'clock. Mm -hmm. Wow. Beautiful. Thank you. Thanks for sharing Beautiful. that. Yeah. I mean, it just goes to show that speaking about things below the surface, you know, these are our values. This is about a way of moving through the world can be a way of actually really getting clear on our traditions, like what's behind the traditions. Any other advice? Or hope. Or hope. Last bits of advice or hope. For the audience. Well, I, I would like to share a hope, and uh, it's simply that we uh, that we're willing to listen this next holiday um, and really be active listeners, patient listeners, and not just listening so you can prepare your rebuttal, but actually really be present with what the other person is saying. Seek first to understand, right, and really do that. Yes, really do that. And maybe have no response, you know, like the, the primary activity is to listen. And not to be listening just from, you know, your head, but also from your heart. Um, yes, exactly. This, I, I think, Mila, every, I, I keep on wanting to note down what you say and have been, but, um, <laughs> but um, we at least perhaps it's a, it's a UK education thing, but um, we're always forced towards conclusions. It's very difficult to come up and I mean, we're kind of doing it here. Like what are the conclusions? What should we be doing? How do we go forward into the world? Um, maybe, maybe, maybe counterintuitively, the, one of the best ways of going out forward into the world is to not look for conclusions, but to, but to love the question. Um, that mm, yeah. lovely, wonderful, quite threatening space of ambiguity allows for so many wonderful things to happen. So loving the questions, I think, uh, mm. is a good starting point too. Thank you. And Kara? We have a norm in our classroom um, that we embrace tension and conflict. And so maybe starting off with some 
norming at the Thanksgiving table about what is, you know, what, what can we all agree to this year um, mm. can also be helpful. Um, and then another question that I've really enjoyed asking this year is what brings you joy? Um, and, and finding the things, you know, particularly in these challenging times for many people, you know, how are we finding ways to, to be, to find time for ourselves and, and care for ourselves? Um, and concluding with how are we going to be responsible for others? Perhaps in your case, carrots involves a little white dog, for, for example. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, he's been good most of the time, but yeah, he, been great. he had to get on my lap now. <laughs> it's been great. So yes, uh, all, all good bits of wisdom, especially I'm fond of the listening piece, because when we really dare to listen deeply, uh, we risk opening our hearts and we risk changing our minds. So in closing, uh, we'd like to thank our panelists, Mila Adlas, host of Future Hindsight, Kara Ang Wendy, host of Democracy Matters, Tori Monte, host of On Opinion, and Steve House of Brave Angels. Please, uh, for our audience, make sure to check out their podcasts, their websites, and the amazing work that they're doing. And of course, thank you to the Democracy Group and to Brandon Stover. And, and thank all of our, we give thanks to all of our audience members for showing up. I'm John Sulipodi. I'm Martha Williams, and you can check us out at breakbread.world. Um, where you can check out what we're doing, our upcoming events, including our next Mindful Conversation course, which starts Tuesday. And if you're listening to this webinar, we have a discount code for you that you will be getting um, in an email to, that will follow this, um, the closing of our event today. So we thank you all very much. It's a joy and a pleasure to hear your wisdom and to play with you today. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks Thank so much. You. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Thank you.